uh, Luigi, each and every one of you. Um, I want to say good morning. My name is Kevin Dillon, Chair of the Committee. I want to welcome to the Homeless and Poverty Committee. Uh, again, this is Kevin DeLeon, Chair of the Committee. It is August 11th, Thursday, 2022. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to the City Clerk uh, so you can call a roll so we can establish a quorum. Uh, Luigi, if you could be so kind enough. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Councilmember DeLeon. Here. Councilmember Rahman. Here. Councilmember Buscaino. Here. Councilmember Rodriguez. Councilmember Rodriguez is absent. Councilmember Blumenfield. Blumenfield. Here. Councilmember Rodriguez is present. Five members and a quorum, Mr. Chair. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Luigi. We, we have everyone with us here today. Uh, Mr. Blumenfield, Ms. Rodriguez, uh, Ms. Rahman, as well as uh, Mr. Buscaino. Uh, yes, uh, welcome to each and every one of you, to all the staff. I want to thank you as well as the public who are tuning, tuning in today. Uh, before we begin taking public comment, I wanted to let the committee know, uh, those who are listening, what the plans are for all the items. We have five items on uh, today. Agenda. Uh, we have a presentation uh, from LASA and the CEO, CAO, I should say, uh, regarding the demobilization uh, plan of Project Roomkey, along with HACLA, in case anyone has any questions uh, for them. The other four items I uh, will recommend uh, uh, moving on consent uh, after public comment with the following recommendations. Item number two, approve the recommendations in the CAO's report. Item number three, I'd like to make the following small technical amendment for the moving clause. Change the last phrase to say, quote, to provide a report outlining options for master leasing or using other contracting mechanisms as needed, the CISA hotel, uh, in order to provide a pathway to permit housing for homeless individuals, uh, end quote. Uh, and finally, items number four and number five, I recommend approving the motions as written. Um, with that being said, let's uh, open up and get ready for our, uh, public comments. I know that we have someone uh, in place today, uh, Gita, and that is, I believe, Mr. Richard Tom from the city's attorney's office. If you could be so kind enough to provide the guidance to the public as they prepare to call it. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay. Uh, to members of the public uh, speak, calling in, when it is your turn to speak, please state your name and which of the agenda items you would like to speak on. You have one minute to speak on one agenda item or two minutes to speak on two or more items. In addition, those who would like to, speak to, uh, to, like to address the committee with general public comment will be provided one additional minute for a maximum of up to three minutes per person for all agenda items, including general public comment. We will inform you when your time is up. When speaking on the agenda items, you must be on topic. Our goal is to get through as many speakers as we can. If you are not speaking on topic, or if we cannot tell whether you are speaking on an agenda item, you will get one brief warning from the chair. If you do not immediately get clearly on topic, or if you stray off topic, you will forfeit the rest of your time, and we will move on to the next speaker. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Richard. Uh, appreciate you uh, appreciating today. <laughs> Uh, for uh, Gita. Uh, Luigi, if you could be so kind of uh, read the instructions for the public wishing to call it. Members of the public who would like to offer public comment on the items listed on the agenda should call 1-669-254-5252 and use meeting ID number 160-453-9676 and then press pound. Press pound again when prompted for participant ID. Once admitted into the meeting, press star 9 to request to speak. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Luigi. So we have staff that's ready to take the public comments. I believe Sarah Flaherty. Uh, we have the incredible Sarah Flaherty today, straight out of Eagle Rock, uh, who will be facilitating uh, today's call. Sarah, if you'd be so kind enough to take it away. Thank you. Uh, council member, um, caller with the number ending 3065. Please. Um, state your name and the items on which you'd like to speak. Hi, this is Susie Shannon Time from Housing with Human Rights, and we um, I'm calling in for general public comment on items one and three. Okay, um, Susie, you have uh, three minutes. 
Thank you. So first of all, we wanted to thank Councilmember Kevin Leone and his staff for their help in rescinding the move out letters that were mistakenly mistakenly sent to residents at the Grand Hotel. We know that those letters caused a lot of stress for people who are living there, including two women um, who are in wheelchairs who got move out letters um, over the weekend for a Monday move out. So we do want to thank um, the council member and his staff for moving on that so quickly and um, kind of writing a mistake that seemingly was made by Rasa and the Salvation Army. Um, for item number three, which is the CISO Hotel, um, the CISO Hotel has had 601 vacant units for almost seven years. Um, since December, they have only leased, um, leased up about 73 units. So again, we applaud Council Member Kevin DeLeon and his staff and the city for moving forward with a lease up program that will help save lives for those who are dying on the street. Um, we desperately need to save our SRO buildings for low income and unhoused folks um, and not allow these owners to convert them to luxury apartments or hotel rooms um, for people who are wealthy. And so um, I'm very excited that this is coming up today because that um, a hotel has remained vacant for so many years, literally having homeless encampments in the shadows of this vacant building. Thank you so much um, for your leadership, Councilmember Kevin DeLeon, and we look forward to today's meeting. Thank you, caller. Caller with the number ending 2970. Please press star 6 to unmute. Caller 2970, please state your name and the items on which you'd like to speak. Yes, my name is Audrey George, and I would like to speak on one, three, and public comment. Great, you have three minutes. Okay, um, first of all, regarding um, the Cecil Hotel, um, it's unclear as to um, the length of time you want to have this master lease cover. Um, and will there be any direct connection between the program itself and the lease? And I'm, you know, also very curious as to why there's no plan to use federal money at all to actually buy instead of lease. Um, and this, that's a, a general complaint I have um, for all the programs that you enter into, we should be looking at buying buildings, buying housing, uh, permanent, you know, that can be permanent supportive housing. Um, I want to know um, who profits from this master lease the most, because I, I find, as always, that there's basically no transparency. Yeah, and what is the funding plan to support this master lease? And then regarding um, number one and sort of general comment, because there's just so much to say. Like, for instance, the issue of, um, of the, the mistakes made regarding the grant. You know, you, you, you treat these so lightly when they so severely impact the mental health of the people that are residents of this Project Room Key. Um, programs where, you know, first of all, they, they fell, they fell uh, subject to all these false promises the city makes in the first place. And then you make mistakes like that. Yes, you have to leave. No, you don't have to leave. Yes, you have to leave, but we don't know when. I mean, you just, nobody can ever heal. And, and these are trigger mental health issues for people that didn't even have them in the first place. Who can, who can live and feel stable? Um, and secure in a situation where they don't know from day to day when their housing will end and what happens after that. The city doesn't have any real plans, and part of that is because unhoused folk are never invited into the process of making these plans in the first place, making decisions. Um, tiny homes, I've challenged before for each of the council members to sleep in a t in, and, and they're actually sheds. We all know they're actually sheds. They leak. 
they have no facilities, that they have no privacy, no, um, no ability to live without all of the usual rules that can get you evicted. There's sheds, and I challenge each of you to go and live in one for one night to challenge yourself. Would you ever, ever have a, anyone you care about or love stay in one of those? You know, show some compassion. Show some empathy. Thank you, caller. Caller with the number ending 3784. Please press star 6 to unmute. Caller 3784, please state your name and the items on which you'd like to speak. Am I unmuted? Yes. Okay, Andrew Gravener, I'd like to speak on item one and general public comment. You have two minutes. All right, thank you. Um, I'm, I'm calling to ask why you're planning on, why you're proposing to kick people out onto the street where you have just recently, and not only that, but just recently, city council has voted to further criminalize being unhoused in LA um, with the new 4118 amendment to that bans encampments near schools and daycare centers. It further limits the air, criminalizes just being out on the streets when nobody should be out on the streets to begin with because not from a standpoint of they shouldn't be there, but from the standpoint that the city should be providing housing and services so that people don't have to be out on the street, because because the unhoused people don't want to be out on the street. The, uh, the people want housing and to feel safe and help in housing and have services. So why are you... so? The city used hotel rooms as a way to shelter people. And while some of the treatment and conditions these people face in the hotels could be improved, um, we still should have a system where people should still be able to, we shouldn't be kicking people out onto the street, basically, especially now that 4118 is being expanded, um, we should be, we should keep people, we shouldn't be kicking people out of hotels when they're having, we should be um, making sure people have shelters and in the long term providing housing services. Oh, and repeal 4118, abolish 4118. Thank you, Carl. Call with the number ending 2282. Please press star six to unmute. Caller 2282, please press star six to unmute and state your name and the items on which you'd like to speak. Hello, my name is Jane Denion. And I would like to speak on items number one, four, and general public comment. Jane, you have three minutes. Thank you. Good morning, uh, everyone, and good morning, Sarah. Um, I do volunteer outreach to our unhoused neighbors in the community where I live. I am opposed to shutting down Project Room Key. This proposal to shut down LA Ground at the end of January 2023 and the other hotels at the end of October 2022 will cause the loss of hundreds of temporary housing units. We need to keep Project Room Key locations open. Simple fact, we need more temporary and permanent housing. There are thousands of unhoused people wanting housing and waiting on the streets all over the city. We are still in a COVID variant surge with many shelter facilities in quarantine. No new intakes are being done in those facilities. And during the winter months, another surge may occur and facilities will not be doing intakes, leaving unhoused individuals on the streets. Individuals in Project Room Key are about to be matched to emergency housing vouchers or are presently matched and looking for permanent housing units. Closing Project Room Key locations will separate voucher applicants from their case managers and housing navigators, which may thwart their progress and create more stress. 
Only 350 individuals have leased units with an emergency housing voucher, according to the HACWA report, and thousands more are searching. We are still waiting the results of the February homeless count. If more people are falling into homelessness that are getting housing, which is a reference to the urgent need for prevention, in item number four, I predict there will be many more people needing temporary, non-congregate housing for at least six months or another year. If Project Room Key closes, the competition for scarce temporary housing will leave many individuals without a roof over their heads and they will end up back on the streets without the option to relocate into other facilities. Individuals we know in Project Room Key right now were given move out notices, but there, but there were no plans to move them to other facilities. Only MC 4118 was so advised. If we had enough housing, no one would have to live on the street and we wouldn't need 4118. Plus the ordinance did not add one unit of housing to Los Angeles. 4118 expansion will force more unhoused individuals into banned location. So therefore, 4118 enforcement will require that Project Room Key rooms be made available to move individuals indoors and off the streets. The LA Alliance settlement stated that LA City would provide housing for at least 60% of the unhoused population, minus those with mental health and substance use issues. But it is questionable that the city has reached even 60% housing for unhoused individuals. And what about the other 40%? Project Room Key could be sustained through state funding. Thank you, caller. Caller with the number ending 1521, please press star 6 to unmute. Good morning. Please state your name and items on which you'd like to speak. Yes, um, good morning. I'd like to speak on item number three. Um, my name is Barbara Schultz. Um, I'm an attorney with Legal Aid Foundation of Los Angeles, and I represent the Wiggins plaintiffs for the Wiggins settlement. The Cecil Hotel is a residential hotel that is protected um, under the Wiggins agreement. It also was recently... Um, recently had all 600 units covenanted for 55 years as affordable housing. We completely support uh, all efforts to um, lease up the Cecil Hotel. Um, I just wanted to note that it is only for permanent housing and cannot be used as shelter. Um, so the, uh, the title of the motion um, did give me some concern. Um, con considering it says a program for temporary homelessness shelter agreement. Um, so I wanted to note that that is not a um, uh, proper use um, for that, but I do hope that um, any, any master lease or any other efforts um, to lease for actual... Thank you, caller. Caller with the number ending uh, 6335. Please press star six to unmute. Six three three five. Please press star six to unmute. With housing is a human right. Hi, this is Betty Toto with Housing is a Human Right. Um, speaking on general public comment items one and three. Um, item one, three three minutes. You, uh, I want you to uh, wanted to thank uh, the council member Kevin De Leon and staff um, for rescinding those move out letters. Uh, this is an extremely stressful situation for the residents of the Grand Hotel. And thank you for working quickly to mitigate that. Um, on the Cecil Hotel, um, you know uh, they have about 601 vacant units um, now for almost seven years. And uh, since December, they have only leased up about 73 units. Um, I want to thank the council members in the city for moving forward with their lease-up program that would help uh, save these lives of, um, you know, these folks that are literally dying on our streets. Um, we need to save our SRO buildings for low-income and unhoused people and not allow these owners to convert them to luxury apartments or hotel rooms for people who are rich. Um, you know, adaptive um, housing and reuse is, is the way to go. 
um, that's what we should be doing with our SROs. Um, so um, please let's um, save those buildings um, for low-income folks and get unhoused people into them. Also, with uh, 4118, um, th this needs to be repealed. This is just a draconian, um, and it is criminal to criminalize the poor. Um, thanks for allowing me for public comment, and um, yeah, bye. Thank you, caller. Caller with the number ending 2979, please press star 6 to unmute. Hello, uh, my name is Peggy Lee Kennedy and with the Venice Justice Committee, and I'd like to speak on item one and general public comment. You have two minutes. Well, you know, it's really hard to be civil uh, uh, because I think outrage is the correct uh, response to this LA City Council. But, uh, you know, I just want to tell you that uh, years ago, we said, you know, take these hotels by eminent domain, you know, create public housing, and people thought, you know, you guys balked at it, oh, it'll take too long, you know, oh, we'll have to enter in court cases. The fact is, is here we are closing them down, we have more homeless people, and this voucher thing is a joke, right? Who out of these vouchers are actually getting housing? Uh, so when you close these um, project room keys down, people go back out on the street. And guess what? When you got them to go in there, you took their tents away. You made them throw their tents away. So, uh, you know, where are people supposed to go? Uh, I got to tell you that... Back in 2000, whatever it was, 6, 7, we passed Proposition 63, NHSA. That's the um, initials for uh, the mental health housing for the, through the state. And as from 2008 through 2021, we the whole state has only developed 837 units uh, or contributed to 837 units for the whole state for people living with major mental health, right? What the hell are you doing, right? You're not creating housing for people, and you're criminalizing them. So what is that about? It's evil, it's racist, it's ableist, and it's wrong. And you people should be ashamed of yourselves. Thank you, caller. Caller with the number ending 0764, please press star 6 to unmute. Zero seven six four. please press star 6 to unmute, and then state your name and the items on which you'd like to speak. Nikki Jackson with Housing as a Human Right, AHS, and I'd like to speak in general public comment items 1 and 3. Yes, uh, first, I, I wish to add my thanks to uh, the council member De Leon and his staff for dealing with the Grand Hotel problem of, of evicting people. However, uh, you know it, it, it's really just chasing chasing the sea away with a broom. Uh, there's so many problems, but in terms of the Cecil Hotel. The Cecil Hotel is the scene of the crime. It was allowed to turn into half hotel and half uh, low-income housing, and that should have never been allowed, and I don't know where the people monitoring these things were and what they were sleeping during all of this, but finally it's back to 601 rooms this effort to, to lease it up, it's got to happen. Our homeless population in Skid Row could be completely housed with all the vacant units and vacancies allowed to accumulate in these hotels. I do not know what has happened with the people who are supposed to be monitoring all these vacancies and, and keeping the housing up for people asleep again. I am only sorry that Charles Dickens is not alive today 
to chronicle what is happening to our city as he so poignantly chronicled, chronicled London. And when we read his, his works, we thought they were a horror story. And we have as bad or worse a horror story on our streets today. And the responses are woefully inadequate. My last quick comment is the tiny house villages. There's something called shade cloth. It's not very expensive. I would put it over these villages as much as possible in the summer. It will save you a lot of money on air conditioning them, and it will make it possible for people to step outside the air conditioning in this kind of heat because they've got radiant surfaces they're sitting on that are radiating heat up, and the best solution for that is shade. And the least expensive thing is shade cloth. So I just wanted to add that in. Thank you. Thank you, caller. Caller with the number ending 9299. Please press star 6 to unmute. Please state your name and the items on which you'd like to speak. Hey, what's up? Um, my name is Joanna. I'd like to speak on item 1 and 3. Um, and general public comment. Oh, three minutes. And, and general people. Yeah, thanks. Um, all right, cool. So, Kevin, for you mostly, by the grant, we know you guys have known about this end of lease for a really long time. There's no excuse to have let it go this long without notifying people and making plans. Don't shift the blame back to LASA. <laughs> it's overtaxed and underfunded right now. Um, and I think it's funny that all these folks on um, supporters of yours are thanking you for, uh, retracting that eviction notice when um, it was organizers who made this public and we were actually being shamed by those same people until we made it public, until we made it public. Um, and the residents made it public. So, you know, would, would those eviction notices have even been retracted? We don't know. Um, people don't even know in there if they have vouchers or not. Um, and even if they do, <laughs> um, who will help them? They don't have any caseworkers and they're helping them navigate you know, this housing market that's dictated by all the injustices of racial capitalism. They're just being thrown back into that chaotic system. And now they're going to be maybe thrown back into that to, you know, make utilize their voucher from a tent when the utilization rate is so low, so low. So that's the option you're giving people. No evictions, no exits. We don't need another luxury tourist hotel. We need housing. We need public housing now. There are 500 people in there. We certainly don't need that site to be redeveloped. Um, into more luxury housing. So we need folks to be given actual keys there. We need you to remove the carceral aspects of that, quote, housing. And you need to remove the service providers that have consistently failed the residents there, um, like Salvation Army, who continue to fail to provide people with adequate dietary needs. Um, they continue to fail to respond to grievances filed to the formal system. Um, I guess onto the Cecil Hotel, um, right, that you're going to turn that into housing. We need ample harm reduction services there. We need wraparound services for many of the people there who are, you know, if they're being moved from the ground, there's a lot of disabled people there and elderly people who need access and, and to be connected to medical services. Um, we need to remember that Ellie Can who fought for those hotels to stay at their house. So um, <laughs> let's give credit where credit is due again. Um, and we don't need the Cecil Hotel to be used as a, as a bargaining chip as the price of clearing communities from across the city and uprooting people from their homes and communities. Um, I think I'm going to go a little further than Audrey, Kevin. I know you need a night in your tiny show. I'm going to give you um, the challenge to sleep in a project room key site for months and months, not knowing when you're going to go home, if you're going to go home. You get to bring one bag and one suitcase. Um, you're going to get treated like shit. <laughs> Um, but, of course, you didn't because you're the council member and you were doing it for PR, right? Um, so, yeah, CZ, KDO wouldn't have done shit if we hadn't made that stuff public. Um, by the grant. Thank you, caller. Caller with the number ending 3713. Please press star 6 to unmute. Please state your name and the items on which you'd like to speak. My name is Ruth. Hi, I'd like to give general public comment, please. 
I want to thank everyone who called in today with the variety of, of thoughts and opinions on the issue. Uh, committee members, as, as I mentioned, uh, colleagues, uh, I'd like to move file items through two through five on consent with an amendment for item number three, as was noted uh, earlier. Do you have any questions or comments from any folks? Yes, uh, Ms. Rama. Um, I, you know, I just had a, I, I'm fine with moving these items forward. I did have just a couple of questions that I would love for the department to address. Um, sure would that be? Uh, item five. Okay, why don't we do this and let's move through two through four. Uh, with amendment to number three, item number three, and for consent, and then we'll hold five so we can ask the, the you can ask the questions that you like. Is that cool? Thank you. Great, you got it. Okay, so colleagues, uh, we're going to move uh, items two through four. Uh, we're going to hold off on five uh, for Ms. Raman, and there's an amendment to item number three. Uh, Mr. Blumenfield uh, has second. Uh, Mr. Verano, Luigi, if you could be so kind enough to please call the roll. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Council Member De Leon. Aye. Council Member Raman. Yes. Council Member Buscaino. Yes. Council Member Rodriguez. Aye. Council Member Blumenfield. Blumenfield, aye. Five ayes, and these items are approved with amendment to item number three. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Luigi, and I thank my colleagues and for the public who's listening right now. We just approved the 12th roadmap report. Uh, this one uh, is uh, the most procedural one that we have had in this committee uh, since uh, I took over as chair. Uh, in our three motions, uh, we are the two motions, I should say. Uh, we directed uh, general services to look into partnering uh, with the Cecil Hotel. Uh, with the master lease uh, program uh, for part of their building. We also instructed the CLA uh, to validate, evaluate the homeless prevention program software, not only by the city, but by LASA and the county to see how we can expand services. So we're going to move to our report, then we're going to hit file item number five uh, for uh, Ms. Raman. Um, if you could please be kind of, uh, Luigi, if you could read into the record, um, the report out that we have today from Ms. Reisman, Molly Reisman, and Christina Dixon. Uh, I'm sorry, Mr. Chair, to confirm, is this for item number five or item number No, it's not. We're going straight to the last report, file item number one. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Item number one are reports from the City Administrative Officer, Los Angeles Homeless Services Authority, and Housing Authority of the City of Los Angeles relative to a proposed plan to close down and demobilize the city's Project Room Key program and emergency housing vouchers. Thank you very much, um, Ms. Ryan. I believe that we have here with this morning uh, Ms. Molly Reisman and Ms. Christina Dixon, uh, both from LASA, to do a brief presentation today. We also have Mr. Doug Guthrie uh, from HACLA, and I believe Mindy uh, from the CEO's office uh, will be here to answer any questions on room key or PRK as we uh, know today. And before we start, I want to provide uh, a little background uh, for our audience because we know that PRK was a program created in order to get our homeless uh, members uh, who are vulnerable to contracting COVID-19 off the streets and into a safe location. And as the pandemic progressed, uh, thousands of unhoused Angelinas were able to have a set place uh, to ride out the pandemic and have a lower chance of actually contracting COVID-19. One of the, actually, one of the unintended consequences, a positive benefit of PRK, was that it allowed us to get many more individuals into the system. And it has made it much more easier to work with uh, individuals who need housing because you don't need to search for them on the streets. They're at one location, in this case, in, in, in five locations. Everyone has known that this is a stopgap uh, temporary measure created by the pandemic and that we needed to take this opportunity to pair people to permanent housing solutions while we know that where they were living temporarily. So with that being said, uh, Lhasa, if you are here, uh, I see Molly. Uh, will it be uh, just you, Molly? Uh, today? Just me, council members. Okay. All right. Uh, go ahead, uh, Molly. Good morning and welcome. Thank you. Good morning, Council Members. Molly Reisman, Co-Acting Executive Director and Chief Program Officer at LASA. 
my partner in good trouble, Christina Dixon, is stuck on a flight um, that was delayed, so you, you just get me this morning. Uh, I'm going to ask Catherine Landers to pull up the slides. Catherine is our manager of government affairs, so we will pull up those slides. I've been asked to present in five to seven minutes, um, so I'm not going to cover every slide as you receive the slides and the written report, and they're attached to the council file ahead of time. Um, so you have all of this information. I'm going to go over the most important points uh, for us this morning, and then we're going to get into discussion, which is the most important thing this morning. Um, so first off, thank you for having us here today to discuss our coordinated plan to demobilize the final Project Room Key sites in Los Angeles, which will require an all-hands-on-deck approach to safely and expediently find housing for the remaining PRK participants. LASA is extremely proud of our partnership with the city and the county to stand up this program. PRK was an emergency response to the COVID-19 pandemic, as Councilmember DeLeon said. The first PRK site was opened within two weeks of the stay-at-home order going into effect. This was a program where we did not have time to plan. We all had to just jump in to save lives. So this is something that we stood up very quickly. Um, we were flying the plane while we were building it, um, and we're very proud of the results. The program, um, since the first PRK site was opened, LASA and our community partners who operate PRK sites have sheltered over 10,000 people experiencing homelessness countywide. Over 4,100 of those participants have already exited homelessness and are in a home of their own. We were very fortunate to be able to support PRK participants to secure permanent housing with the Recovery Rehousing Program and Emergency Housing Voucher Program. The combination of PRK, Recovery Rehousing, and EHVs were critical to being able to have PRK be a path to exit homelessness for the PRK participants. Even with these critical resources, there has not been enough permanent housing resources for all of the PRK participants, and we have faced a significant gap in the resources needed. We are here this morning to present on the remaining PRK sites and how we can partner together to ensure that PRK continues to be a life-saving and transformative program for every participant. Next slide. Slides two through five. Um, cover the current state of the three city PRK sites and the county-funded um, site, the Cadillac. Um, I'm not going to go over every single site. Um, this first slide gives you just the overview of the number of participants in each of the sites. And if we can go to the next slide. So we have slides, slides three through five, cover each of the sites. So starting with Highland Gardens, the number of participants that we have on site, the number of emergency housing vouchers in hand, the number of emergency housing vouchers in process, um, the number of participants that have any permanent housing resource. So some of our folks have been able to secure other resources like BASH and COC vouchers. Um, and then what is the gap? How many don't have any permanent housing resource in hand? Then we go into services, because we know that it's great to get somebody a voucher, but they need help being able to utilize that voucher. We have a very tight rental market, so it's need the services to help them identify an apartment and a landlord who will accept that voucher. And then if we do not extend the site, um, how many interim housing beds we need to be able to safely exit everyone from these sites. Next slide. So we provided these numbers for the LA Grand as well, our largest site with 504 participants. Next slide. And the Airtel, um, which has 218 participants um, as of August 2nd. Next slide. So I want to focus on our recommendations this morning. Losses need three recommendations to ensure that we achieve the best outcomes we can for our PRK participants. We're committed to supporting as many PRK participants as possible to secure permanent housing. But the resources that are going to be available to make that happen will dictate the outcomes. This is about resources. So our first recommendation is to extend all three PRK sites 
to stop intake so we can focus on the participants that are there today and focus on making interim housing beds available for those participants who are not able to secure permanent housing. Um, so the most important thing is to be able to extend the sites um, so that we can get the best outcomes. Um, can we go to the next slide? Um, and again, this is the recommendations of when to extend the sites to. This is also in the CAO report about extending Highland Gardens to October 31st, Airtel to October 31st, and the grant to June, uh, sorry, January 31st. Next slide. Um, we talked about that we need to stop intake so we can focus on uh, the participants that are there today. Next slide. And finally, this slide talks about the interim housing beds that are available across the city. Our goal is to get as many people into permanent housing. But like I said, that's dependent on resources. If we don't have that resources, those resources, we're going to have to fall back on our interim housing portfolio. Um, so this just shows you a snapshot. As you'll see, there are not, as of uh, Tuesday, enough interim housing beds for every PRK participant who potentially would need an interim housing bed. Um, just a point of order, I see there is a hand up. Did folks want me to pause in the presentation? No, why don't you continue? Uh, and uh, those are folks who are going to ask questions about you, so go ahead. Okay, great. Next slide. Recommendation two that we recommend doing in addition to recommendation one um, is focused on providing additional resources so we can connect more PRK participants to permanent housing. Uh, these resources focus on housing navigation and services for folks who have an EHB voucher but need that help finding an apartment and stabilizing in an apartment. Um, then we're also recommending um, that there are folks who might need housing navigation and time-limited subsidies. Because as you saw in the previous slides, we do have a significant gap between those PRK participants that have a, re a permanent housing resource in hand and those that don't. And so we highly recommend funding both housing navigation and time-limited subsidies um, for those individuals who don't have any permanent housing resource as of today. Um, and finally, there are some folks who might only need housing navigation. Next slide. We have a lot of details in the next slide about what housing navigation is, what it does. Um, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail here, but you have this in the slides. Next slide. Um, and next slide. So again, a lot of budget breakdown for everyone so you can understand the costs associated with housing navigation to help people, again, secure those critical apartments to make their vouchers work for them. Next slide. So recommendation three is inclusive of recommendations two, uh, one and two. So we recommend extending the sites. We recommend funding um, services and housing resources. And finally, we recommend trying to secure housing supply. Because um, supply is critical to, again, make sure those vouchers can be utilized. Um, we, like I said, have a very tight real estate market. Um, so this is a hard market to just utilize a voucher. You need extra support to be able to make those vouchers work. Um, and there are some exciting opportunities as the council is already exploring in some of your other items this morning for securing additional supply, which is great. Next slide. Um, I'm not going to go into detail here again. I'm going to go to our final slide and just say um, we are uh, very focused um, on doing everything we can to improve the pace of lease-ups. Um, we recommend that the city approve all of the recommendations we've put forward, and we on our side will be working with HACLA to expedite uh, emergency housing voucher application processing. Um, we are holding in-person and virtual housing fairs and doing regular calls with all of the sites with our housing acquisition unit. We have a team that are at the Airtel as we speak in person, um, walking participants through what are available out, uh, apartments in their area that they can consider. We're going to continue to do those um, events. Um, and we're going to ramp up our activities. Um, and we've made a request to the city for some additional resources and uh, disaster services workers um, to help us um, expand our unit acquisition activities and try and get that critical supply to as many people as possible. So I'll end just by saying LASA is profoundly and deeply committed 
to helping every PRK participant find a permanent housing um, unit that they can utilize to exit homelessness. It's going to be a challenge. It's going to take resources and it's going to take partnership. Um, but we're very grateful for the opportunity to have this discussion this morning. Um, and with that, I think we can um, end the slideshow and open it up for questions. Thank you very much, uh, Molly. I want to uh, thank you very much for the presentation. I know we have uh, questions uh, from uh, my colleagues on the committee. I, I do want to take a moment uh, to express uh, have to be, be candid, you know, frustrations or that my team and, and I, the, the homeless and public community, have regarding the, the report. I think for that for the last few months. We have the Homeless and Poverty Committee, along with the CAO's office, along with the Mayor's office, uh, have been trying to get a detailed report uh, from LASA on how specifically they, as the lead of the Continuum of Care and the entity charged with administering PRK, Project Moonkey, um, how to ensure that the residents who are participating in the program currently right now are going to be, and this is the key word here, uh, this is I think what we all agree on, how they're going to be successfully exited uh, from the program uh, into permanent housing solutions. Now, that, that being said, also to interim, also too, because we know the supply issue it, on the permanent side is, is, is critical. Uh, I know that the mayor, and I know uh, for a fact that the mayor's office actually first made the request of LASA, I believe, in late January of this year, that's over seven months ago, when those conversations were taking place with regards to the 22-23 uh, city budget. Um, there have been a string of emails from all three of the city agencies, the, the Homeless and Poverty Committee, uh, the CA, uh, CAO's office, as well as the mayor's office, you know, uh, asking you know, for a demobilization plan. Uh, in response, uh, no plan was provided. And it was brought up in weekly meetings again and again. And still, no plan was provided. And, and I think finally, out of just utter frustration, the city council had to formally, you know, direct LASA, the entity that you represent, as a co-CEO CEO, to produce a, a demobilization plan. And, and still with a, a, a council directive, it, it still took nearly not one week or two weeks or three or, or four, but five weeks from when council acted to get a report actually in hand. And after all of that, the report today, I, I don't think begins to attempt to address the situation you know, even remotely well. Uh, I got to be frank. Uh, what this does, is this tells the committee and the council as a whole that LASA has at no time during over the two-year lifespan of the program created or even thought of, maybe thought of, you know, an exit strategy for program that everyone knew was temporary. And all this adds to the frustration I think many of us feel on this committee when working with LASA, who's supposed to be a, a, a partner, and it doesn't always feel like they're we're, we're treated as a partner. When we ask for the information, when we ask for timelines, when we ask for long-term planning, it's almost like we feel like we have to fight tooth and nail to get it. And that's why I know there are folks on this committee and there's folks around the horseshoe that, that feel like the current structure of the JPA, the Joint Power Agreement, is not conducive to actually getting people off the streets and into either interim or permanent housing you know, in the city. And I think we all agree, you know, you know we all agree that the, the residents of LA in the last six years have been saying yes to both interim and permanent solutions across the city, across the region. We owe it to them to, to show that, you know, we're actually working, you know, to move people inside with the interim shelter. And once again, once aside, we prioritize those individuals 
and finding the permanent housing for them and not risk having them fall back onto the streets. Now, I, I get it. I understand it. That rental market right now is as is, 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 is tight as it can be, and tighter than any period, uh, at least in, in, in recent memory. Uh, so folks are competing with each other, you know, with all the emergency voucher housing um, uh, um, uh, vouchers that they have in their hand. You know, so everyone's competing, uh, you know, everyone's sort of like competing for a small allotment that currently exists right now. Uh, uh, during a time when, you know, rentals are, 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 are going up. My biggest concern is the loss report lacks a concrete plan on how we move forward. It asks for extensions, but it doesn't lay out a plan to how they will be implemented if we vote to extend. And we have already seen, you know, problems arise, you know, in the last months. We have all of the issues uh, that happened when the Mayfair, uh, which is in CD1. Uh, the Mayfair, when it was in CD1, uh, was demobilized, and my staff, along with members of the mayor's team, were at the location to talk with the owner regarding their concerns and see the condition of the property after the site was demobilized. And just recently, LASA told folks that they were going to need to start exiting the LA Grand, for example, which is in my district in CD14, where we absorbed a lot of unhoused individuals, not just primarily from CD14, but from throughout the city of Los Angeles. And however, no one communicated with my team, again, the mayor's office, or the CAO's office. And once again, my team spent that weekend, they left their vacations, they left the engagements they had with family members, and they had to interject and literally go onto the site to learn what was actually going on. And once again, there was no plan for from LASA and how they were going to actually proceed. So it, uh, I, I, I'm, I'm hoping, you know, Molly, that you can understand the, the, the deep frustrations that, that we're all having here um, because the demobilization plan, every individual, whether it is in, from the Highland Gardens, or whether it's the LA Grand, which is the biggest one of them all, or the Airtel Plaza in the Valley, um, or the Cadillac, and this Cadillac is a smaller number, and then, although that is county funded, how every individual has to be placed. Ideally, if they have that voucher into permanent housing, and if not, because the stock inventory is not there, the competition is, is very fierce in the marketplace, then the interim housing, because if they're walking around with the voucher and we still can't match them up to the physical you know, asset itself, then having a voucher is great, but it's like winning the lottery still, waiting for that one unit to open up, that two unit to open up somewhere, you know, in town, around town. And that's where lies, I think, you know, a deep frustration. We understand the gargantuan seismic macro issues with regards to demand and supply and the master plans, you know, master leasing, I should say, and the inability to move quickly in terms of building capital assets so we can move folks quickly into those permanent units. But we knew this was temporary. You know, I, I, I think the Mayfair is an example of not knowing not, of what not to do, you know, specifically. And that is, you know, part of the, the deep frustrations. Um, I know you inherited a whole massive operation, too. You know, but my first question, you know, for you, Lhasa, is, is the, what we've been trying to stand. Specifically and clearly. What is the plan to demobilize the Airtel in the Valley, the Highland Gardens, which I believe is in CD4, in this Raman's district, the LA Grand, CD14 on FIG, which is in my district? And to be more specific, what is the plan for each day, you know, of the rest of August, this month of August, all of September, October, November, December, and in the month of January. Because if I'm counting your numbers here, and I'm just saying this off the top of my head, 
66 at Highland Gardens, LA Grand 504, uh, Airtel Plaza 218, that's 700, uh, that's uh, 800, uh, 850, Let, let's just round off the number, 1,000, you know, uh, 1,000 individuals between now and I believe the end of October and another site at the end of January have to be placed. They cannot, no full wear shape, be going back onto the streets. And that's why we need the specificity, the details that helps us so we can help each other, so we can both accomplish the goals that we want. The immediate goal is, is how do we get them directly into either A, the interim, or the permit. Ideally, the permit, I understand those dynamics right now, and if it's the interim, it's the interim. But that's the plan we need with a lot more specificity and clarity. And, and please feel free, you know. But, you know, that is my question to you, Molly. And council member, I just want to say, I hear your frustration. I share your frustration. This is a massive endeavor. Moving 800 people is a huge endeavor. Um, and it is something we all have to do in lockstep together. Um, and we certainly don't do it perfectly all the time. Um, I do want to say LASA did release a recovery rehousing plan in fall of 2020. From the very beginning of PRK, we have been focused on what is the exit strategy? What is it going to take to move people from PRK to permanent housing? That has absolutely been our focus. We've been requesting resources for that. We're incredibly grateful to the city for the investment made in recovery rehousing. The recovery rehousing program was slated to end in Ju on June 30th. We went to the city in the fall and we said, please, in our general fund budget request we requested funding for the recovery rehousing program we've absolutely been thinking about this we care very deeply about it but you're right this is about coordination and this is about communication um, the exit notices at the ground we take full responsibility for that was absolutely a misstep missteps are going to happen sometimes and that was a misstep um, we have tried to correct that misstep immediately we now have weekly meetings with uh, the three council offices your office uh, Councilwoman Raman's office um, and Council President Martinez's office every week to make sure we're in lockstep because that was a moment where we did not know the extension that the city was considering for the grand um, and we got ahead of the city and we can't get ahead of each other. We've got to be in lockstep. I think we're in good shape now with those weekly meetings. Each site has a slightly different plan because they're all in slightly different places, working with different dates, working with different numbers of people in terms of who has resources, permanent housing resources and who doesn't. Um, for the LA Grand, we're working very closely with Salvation Army. They put together a great proposal of who needs to be targeted first for demobilization. Um, they've made it, they've put it into three phases. Your office has seen those details. And again, like I said, we're working in lockstep. Um, to make sure we do this carefully. We are going to have to do this. You can't just, you know, turn it on and off. It's a process. Um, so some folks are going to have to be slowly exited out of these sites, and we're going to support those folks first with offering permanent housing resources because that is our number one goal to get folks into permanent housing. If those permanent housing options are not the right fit, then what we do is we have daily calls in the morning and in the afternoon. In the morning, we work with the provider at each of the site. Um, once we're in demobilization, which we're not formally in, um, but once we're informally in demobilization, we have morning calls every day where we say, okay, these are the interim housing resources that are, that are available. At this ABH site, we have this many beds that are on hold for you. At this tiny home village, we have this many uh, uh, cabins that are available for you. Um, and then they meet with participants one by one, talk about the resources that are available, what's going to work for them, and then at the end of the day, we do a second call to say, okay, what happened? What worked? Who were we able to move? Who were we not able to move? What plan do we need to put in place? So there's very close communication. We're also tracking those resources because we know that that was one of the things that there was a lot of concern about around the Mayfair. Um, we were tracking, but it was hard to report out from Excel spreadsheets, so we're working with our data team on how can we report out for every single room 
what was offered, how many offers were made, what was the outcome. These are not things that are traditionally tracked in our HMIS system, so we're working on making sure we can report that regularly to the city for these future sites. So we don't do it perfectly, but we learn from our mistakes, um, and, we, and we're very clear about the need to coordinate with the city and are making sure we're doing that going forward. Molly, um, you, you made reference, uh, obviously, to uh, the grant and the Salvation Army report, and, and I think that the, uh, I'll give them credit in, in terms of sort of disaggregating and breaking down, you know, each individual and, and what their needs are. Who is low acuity, who is high acuity, mid acuity, moderate acuity, who just doesn't want any type of, of service at all whatsoever. Those individuals may be folks who self-exit themselves. They may end up on the streets. To your point, nothing is perfect because this is not, you know, easy stuff. We're dealing with folks who there's drug issues, dealing with folks who have severe mental health issues, dealing with folks um, uh, who have a lot of complexity. So, no one's going to ask for, you know, to you to bat 1,000 or loss of bat 1,000. Uh, but what we do need to do is, and I think they have a game plan, you know, you can take that game plan and you have to segregate data of your universe of the various subsets of those, to your point, in terms of the, 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 the placements uh, that, that are needed. Obviously, you'll need that with your service provider at the Airtel, at the... Um, uh, the Highland Gardens, um, um, as well as uh, the county one, um, uh, the, the, Cadillac, the, the Cadillac one right there. So it, it's really, I, I hate to use this analogy, but I'm just going to use it anyways. You know, this is almost like Dunkirk. You got all these folks on the beach, and you got to go get them and rescue them and bring them back home into safe landing. And that's, we are in August, uh, what are we, August 10th today, I think, August 10th, 11th. We are August 11th today, and or we work from December 31st, if that's the grand, the other ones, if it's in October, and work backwards uh, in terms, because this is a, a, a gargantuan task right now uh, to take all these individuals with all the various acuities and place them uh, in the best environment that's uh, conducive to them. And quite frankly, sometimes I get it. It's going to be the best environment that we got at this moment, you know. Um, so that's why, you know, this is a gargantuan task. And I think that you're going to have to stay very, very close with my office, the CAO's office, the mayor's office, and the committee members here, Ms. Rodriguez, and Mr. Blumenfield, Ms. Rahman, and Mr. Buscaino. You know, so this goes off as seamless as possible. I do want to, you know, thank uh, 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 Matt Sabo, you know, and, and, and his team for their companion uh, report because I think it, it clearly lays out what needs to be done, you know, by, by all of you at LASA. So I, I want to give, um, you know, some uh, recognition as well, too. Uh, I want to say that your report at the next committee meeting it needs a detailed plan and how you're addressing each individual to ensure, again, that they are moving into either an interim site or their own apartment with their own voucher. And if it, it also needs a breakdown of resources, and I'll, we'll get you all these details here, you know, uh, 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 Molly, um, so you or, or, or your staff doesn't have to write it all down, but it's going to need a detailed resources, uh, 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 breakdown of resources that you're using and that you need. And what you need, additional disaster service workers, you know, folks in DOT, uh, because the CEO's report uh, asked for weekly updates on the status of PRK. And I think that's going to be needed, you know, for the next hearing that we have. Obviously, between now and then, we will be meeting you know, my staff with you or my staff with your staff and any other committee members, staff members, you know, who, who want to participate, join in, by all means, you're, you're more than welcome. I know we do have some questions here uh, from, the, from my colleagues here, and I do have uh, some questions for um, uh, uh, Mr. Guthrie, who is from here from Hakla as well, too. 
So I'm going to go with Miss uh, Straight Out of the Valley. Uh, that is uh, Moni, Miss Monica Rodriguez Moro. The, the floor is yours. Ay, ay, ay. Thank you for that very long introduction. Valley represent. Valley represent. <laughs> uh, but. Uh, Thank you, Molly, and, uh, you know, I think Kevin really covered it, but look, there's no simple answer in all of this. One of the biggest challenges that we have, obviously, and, and frankly, that thwarts the success of this, is the need for more uh, housing navigation. And so, you know, I appreciate uh, the highlight of, of the necessity for that work. Could you please go over what an effective ratio would be for, uh, well, first of all, for, for the housing placements, what's typically the ratio of uh, individuals that are assigned to case manage and uh, assist in the housing navigation uh, based on the uh, housing typology that individuals are currently uh, residing in? Thank you, council member. So, um, we are working almost exclusively with what's called tenant-based resources, which means somebody gets an emergency housing voucher or a time-limited subsidy resource, and then they need to go out and need to find an apartment where they can utilize that. They need to find a landlord who's got an affordable rent and who will accept that resource, which is quite complicated in the tight rental market we have. Um, so we've been relying on housing navigators. Um, the ratio of housing navigators to clients is one full-time housing navigator for 20 clients. That, those navigators are required to meet with their clients at least once a week, but many do more. Um, in addition to providing listings about what's available, putting together a housing plan, talking with the participant, where do you want to live? What are you looking for? What do you need? Um, in addition to doing all of that work, they also have resources to assist with transportation, to assist with um, application fees. Um, they might need some resources to help with security deposits if we're not able to secure that through another source. So they have a variety of resources they're bringing to the table to help each participant lease up with the voucher they have. Um, I also just want to point out that the CEO's report did recommend additional funding for housing and navigation, which we're very grateful for. But I want to point out that only works for folks who already have a permanent housing resource. You do have a significant number of folks in PRK um, who do not have a resource. So we have also requested funding for additional time-limited uh, subsidies to help those folks who don't have a resource in hand, as well as services to help people stabilize. Because we want people to find that apartment and get inside and exit homelessness, and we want them to exit homelessness for good. Um, and oftentimes folks need some support to stabilize in their new apartment as well. Um, so we did request funding that was higher than the amount in the CAO report so that we could provide um, both subsidies and additional supportive services. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, and I, and I recognize and I, I'm just going to kind of take a, an opportunity because it, it's, it's a little, uh, <clears throat> it's a little disingenuous some of the some of the comments that were made previously uh just in terms of what you know setting reasonable expectations about how we facilitate and as you indicated in this very uh restrictive uh and challenging housing market uh the idea that it's very easy to identify permanent solutions for individuals uh, given the all, all the complexities associated on a case-by-case -case basis, uh, you're confronted with a number of challenges. It's really easy for individuals to cast, uh, you know, uh, criticism uh, about uh, what they're entitled or, or anticipating that, you know, people should help. How people should be accommodated. If we only have a, a unit in North Hollywood, but they, you know, want to live uh somewhere else it, you know it's it makes it very challenging to match uh given the the sheer numbers that we have um but i, I recognize that you guys are you know you're working on what you got but uh the housing navigators are a critical part of making sure that we're able to facilitate and connect these individuals in a timely fashion so that we can get them out of these temporary uh in these temporary placements. So, um, 
you know, I can appreciate the, the challenges and the complexities associated because the, the case needs are, you know, it, it's not a one size fits all. It's, and, and you know, it, and far from it. It's, uh, you know, there's at least any number of configurations that, you know, there's an infinite number of dynamics um, that are impacting placements. And um, so while I know everyone has this uh, solution that they continue to, you know, pop off on uh, when they call in, it's, it's not as, uh, it's, it's not as easy uh, as it's otherwise suggested to be. And um, so I, I'm, I'm happy to see the navigation. I think it's an important part, um, but clearly, you know, we also need to identify what those permanent solutions are going to look like and uh, getting those online as quickly as possible. Um, I just hope that uh, for the individuals that are that are calling in and uh, and uh, that continue to reflect and opine, uh, you know how uh, how terrible of job we're all doing, uh, that they're equally uh, investigating or talking and calling on uh, some of the other cities, the other 87 cities in the county of Los Angeles, uh, who continue to maintain. Um, frankly, uh, enforcement practices that are far more egregious than 4118. Uh, but I will stop with that and say thank you. Okay, okay. thank you very much, Moni. Uh, we'll go to another one that's straight out of the valley, the West Valley, that is Councilmember Bob Bloomfield. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you, Molly, for, for the presentation and for, for stepping up in the way that you are. Uh, and. I certainly appreciate that. I also want to echo Mr. DeLeon's frustration, though, and it's not directed at you as you're sort of recently taking on this role, but it is so frustrating just, just to, that this problem that we're having on demobilization is sort of coming up when it was not at all unpredictable. And, and we've been asking for the demobilization plan for a long time, and, and it's just, it feels like we get, we're just constantly dealing with an agency that's dragging its feet um, on a lot of this stuff, and it's just, it's its beyond frustrating. Um, so it's good that we have this this plan, although I don't, and, and by the way, Mr. Chair, I, at first I thought your World War II reference, Dunkirk, was a little obscure, but I thought, actually, as I thought about it, it's actually a good one. Um, in terms of part of the problem that we have uh, is that we're not dealing with the you know, on the granular level of how do we deal with each of these people. We keep looking at this big system, uh, and a lot of times the, the folks are getting lost who are actually need to be rescued one by one, not necessarily in a wiki dink World War II boat, but in with our, our services and practices. The, the housing, a couple of questions. The, um, the housing navigators, I'm curious how effective they are and what you know what they really need because just sort of having more navigators in some ways doesn't create more housing uh, and in fact it may be an, it, not the right way to spend our limited resources if the navigators don't have what they need to get the housing uh, and it, it's it's frustrating because uh, I, I'll tell you last, last week last week I, yeah um I did something I do regularly. I, I had dinner with the folks who live in my cabin, one of the cabin communities in my district. You know, bought a whole bunch of pizzas and and just to have a discussion with the residents there. And one of my big frustrations that came out of that is the majority of folks who were we were having dinner with um, had vouchers, and and the majority of the many of them had been there for over a year, a year in transitional housing um, and you know yes they hadn't met with their navigator enough and part of it is that we need more navigators but even having met with the navigators the navigators aren't able to do anything for them because there's no there's nowhere to go at the end of the tunnel so just getting more navigators when there's no there's no out doesn't may not help us unless but this is what I'm trying to understand unless it's just really that that they can it feels like there's a diminishing return on the navigators if there's nowhere for no no money to go. So part of it is how how do we assess the efficiency of a navigator? Um, 
and, and I don't mean that about them particularly, but about the whole process. If you have 20 per client, how many people do they house a day? Does one navigator actually get housed a day? Do those 20 clients remain with them for a year? Or, are, you know, what's the turnover in terms of actually getting folks done? Um, I guess I'll start with a question and build on that. And council member, you are 100% correct. The key to making any of this work is housing supply. Um, you know, we can have the most talented folks in the world out there doing this work for our community providers, but if there's no supply for them to access, they can't be successful. Um, we've got to be working on supply at the same time that we're working on coordination. Coordination is key. I mean, folks need, the, they need their hands held to help them get to an apartment because even if you have supply, you know, it's, a compli it's complicated filling out applications and dealing with application fees and credit checks and all the things people go through when they're trying to lease an apartment. So they need that support, but the supply is critical too. Um, so a few things about our navigators. We have done some work about trying to address supply. We have the PATH lease-up program, um, which a lot of our agencies are using, um, where landlords list their available apartments and PATH pays holding fees to make sure those apartments are open and then they list them and try and get the navigators to utilize the apartments that are available. So that's one strategy. It's not enough. Um, it helps some, not enough. Um, we also have our resident property and support services program that's also a partnership with PATH where they are um, they're entering into agreements with landlords for entire buildings. That has been effective for a number of our PRK participants. It's a very new program, but it seems to be working and we're really excited about the early success of that program. It is helping. It is still not enough. Um, you know, we need a lot more supply. It is very challenging. We've been doing a lot of work to make housing navigation more effective. We are asking navigators to get people housed within 90 days. They have a very set time frame they're supposed to be working on to help people get housed. We're just beginning that, so we don't know how successful it's going to be yet. How often does that happen? G given the, the, the anecdotal conversations I've had with many folks, 90 days would be a dream for most people. Who, are, who have vouchers in hand. I mean, has anybody gotten housed in 90 days? Yes, I think some people have. I don't think it's the norm. We want to make it the norm, but I don't think it's the norm yet. I think you're right. A lot of people wait a lot longer. I would also say a lot of people don't have navigators. Um, navigators are a very small portion of our system. So very few people even have a navigator today. Um, so it's not that everybody has a navigator and the navigators aren't just, just aren't working. It's that there are a lot of people who don't even have that um, and are out on their own searching for apartments. Um, we're trying to make this as efficient as possible. We've identified this as one of our key system goals is that we've got to move people through interim housing faster. We need interim housing to be a pathway to permanent housing. There's too many people, just like you said, staying way too long. Um, and we don't want folks, you know, losing hope. Um, we really want it I to be a that, pathway. That was the most devastating part of the dinner was hearing people who were so hopeless after all this time and not seeing the exit and so and and that's that's where we've got to get the the interim and, and i do worry by the way maybe you can press this too we focus all the energy on the prk folks then the folks in these interim sites are now lower priority to getting into those very few units and so that people who've been there for a year or more are, are going to languish and we are very focused on our entire interim housing portfolio. Measure H does fund housing navigation, not at the scale we need it, um, but it does fund some housing navigation, um, which we have dedicated to interim housing sites. And we're working um, to make sure that we're matching the folks who are in the sites. But it's not at the scale we need. Not everybody's going to get that support. But we're hoping that'll, that'll at least help us get some throughput in our, interim, in our entire interim housing portfolio. So I don't, I don't want you to think that PRK is the only thing we're focused on. It is, it is something that's important. We want to make PRK be successful in terms of these demobilizations. But we really want to um, do this across our entire system, that interim housing be that pathway to permanent housing. And by the way, you know, there's some good data in the PRK detailed data we finally have gotten here. I would like this data to be generated for our interim sites as well. And I know I've asked for this before, but I'm going to ask for it formally here in this meeting. Uh, yes. 
and to you know the next steps to locate all the folks with it with, who have these housing vouchers, the people I was having dinner with, etc. Um, I've been asking for this for months, so can you get us the data? And we are releasing for the first time our quarterly system key performance indicators that have specific interim housing outcomes. That comes out at the end of September, and we will be coming to this committee with that data every quarter. Now, it's going to be sort of large scale at first, and we're going to work on getting more and more detailed data. Um, but we're going to be able to at least tell you how the interim housing system is performing to start. So we are planning to come to this committee um, with that data. That's, you know, you can't fix what you can't measure, and so that's that's important. What, what kind of reporting, if any, will LASA or the LACOC have to provide HUD and FEMA related to Project Room Key? Um, uh, Project Room Key is a FEMA program, not a HUD program, so we only have to report to FEMA. FEMA is very focused on reimbursement. Um, so the documentation that FEMA focuses on is not where do people go, it's how do we document that people were eligible for the program, were in the program. Um, that is the primary documentation. It's extraordinary, the amount of documentation we have to provide to FEMA. It is a gargantuan effort, um, but we work very closely with the city um, on the, the FEMA documentation. But like I said, that's just focused on eligibility and proving the, the, that the that somebody was at the hotel getting what we said they were getting. It's, it's very focused on, on that um, and not the outcomes. And just because just I'm trying to understand how the LASA housing process works, what's the role of LASA's Housing Central Command in all of this? Um, housing Central Command is focused on making our permanent housing resources as efficient as possible. Um, so we, that really focuses on making sure we're leasing up any project-based units, any of our COC units as quickly as possible. So some of our folks are um, using those resources. We also do use it to coordinate um, with the housing authorities around the emergency housing vouchers, which a significant number um, of our PRK participants have been able to secure those emergency housing vouchers. So it is a place where we come together to problem solve around the permanent housing resources. I have a million questions, generally, but I, I know this is one report, so I'm going to give it back to the chair to have my, give my colleagues some time on this. So thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you, uh, uh, Bob. Um, and if there are any questions, again, that are specific to this, you know, by, by all means, please you know, feel free. I want to uh, hold you back. If there's some other questions that you want to ask that will be a reaction to the, to the report for the next meeting, then balance either way. Um, before we go to um, our, our, our next colleague, uh, our vice chair, uh, Ms. Raman, uh, prior to the next HMP meeting, uh, Homeless and Poverty meeting, and, and working with the CAO, can you, Molly, have the first report with the details and plan completed by next Thursday and upload it to the council file? Yes. We're prepared for that. Yeah, yes. Okay. So I'm going to hold off on my question uh, with regards to, to, to Mr. Guthrie right now over a hack along with Doug, and we'll go to Ms. Robin. Ms. Robin. Great. Thank you so much, and thanks for all the detailed questions and answers that have already been asked. Um, and uh, thank you, Molly and Christina, for all your work in, in taking over um, at a very challenging time uh, and moving this process forward and I look forward to working with you on uh, continuing the process of demobilizing our PRK site in a smooth way um, in, in CD4. Um, I had a specific question about the report that you shared um, about uh, outcomes. Um, in the report it's mentioned that about 26% of participants in PRK exited to permanent housing compared to only 11% of participants in non-PRK interim housing. Um, and I, that figure really struck me. Um, it feels like PRK, uh, something about it, made it much more successful than other interim housing interventions that you were looking at um, in this report and wondered whether you could speak to that issue. 
Um, and to clarify, that was a statistic that um, came from the county um, chief executive office. That was an early analysis of the PRK program. The outcomes have actually gotten even better um, since that report that I think only measured through October 2021, if I'm correct. Um, so the outcomes are looking even better for PRK, but yes. Uh, many people leave our interim housing portfolio overall and return back to the streets, um, which is why we have a very significant focus on trying to improve the outcomes from our interim housing programs for people to exit to permanent housing. Um, that is an ongoing challenge um, with shelter programs. Um, you know, a lot of folks come into these programs directly from encampments in the streets. They have a lot of challenges, and I want to be completely honest, it is not easy to live in interim housing. We have to be honest about that. Even these hotels, yes. we have had many people return to the streets, not because, you know, the hotels aren't, you know, the, the rooms are nice, but it's hard. There's curfews, there's limits on guests, there's all sorts of rules. Um, and that can be, you know, that would be hard for me. <laughs> you know, like, let's, let's be honest, you know, it would be hard for any of us to live in an environment with a lot of rules. Um, and so these are challenging places to live, which is why it's so important to move people out through permanent housing as fast as possible. Because these, it is hard to live in interim housing and we can't fool ourselves about that. Um, it, is, it is always going to be hard. It's communal living. Even if you have your own room or your own tiny home, it's still communal living. Yeah. And it's challenging. Do you, but do you have a sense of why the outcomes were different for PRK versus other forms of interim housing? I think that I'm particularly interested in this because of a couple of reasons. Um, but the primary among them is that we are now looking at making further investments in interim housing in the city of LA as we wind down PRK. Yeah. So I'm, you know, I'm really curious about what are the lessons it's taught us about yeah. the success across, of various kinds of these. Across the board, non-congregate, what we call non-congregate, which means you have your own space, you have your own room, or you have your own tiny home, has better outcomes. Um, because it's, it's still hard, but it's not as hard as when you've got a bed right next to 30 other people. Um, and so clearly what we see is that people will hang in there longer when they're in what's called a non-congregate setting because it is a more comfortable place to be. It's more desirable. We know that. I mean, that's across the board been proved as well. Yeah. Much more desirable for folks on the streets to go into non-congregate interim housing, um, and the outcomes are better. Great. Um, housing navigation services, um, were they included initially as part of the costs for PRK and how we were thinking about operating them? No, I mean, I, I, I want to bring us back to March 2020. Yeah. You know, March 2020 was saving lives. We were in the boot, whatever we had to do to save lives. Um, PRK is designed around FEMA reimbursement. It's really um, a program in, in response to what FEMA made available. FEMA did, does not fund housing navigation. It does not fund case management. It only funds the operations right. of these sites. So it did not fund any housing navigation. The only, the, when we started to get housing navigation is when we got the recovery rehousing program, which came out of our recovery rehousing plan that came out in fall 2020. Um, the first investment in that was the county put coronavirus relief funds, and then the emer emergency solutions grant coronavirus funds became available from both the city and county. But that was much later, never funded by PRK, not part of the original PRK model. And so through... But but we have had some housing navigation services provided after yes. this investment in in late 2020. But these additional investments will help us move forward with with these individuals. The, the challenge for us is we we were able to launch the recovery rehousing program, which has been critical. We've gotten over 3,600 people just through that program mm -hmm. off the streets, um, which is fantastic. But it was never sized to meet the need of PRK. What happened was it was originally sized to the original sort of level we were at PRK with, but as PRK, remember, we've had so many extensions of these sites and so many new people who've come in, and we never were able to scale recovery rehousing to meet the need of all the new people who came in. So there ended up being a significant gap. Was that gap ever 
brought to the attention of the it, city, or, or if it was, can you just point it me? Was, to it was that? in our yeah. budget request. Um, so we put in our budget request that there was a gap for recovery rehousing. Um, you know, we meet with the mayor's office, CAO, um, CLA, every two weeks to go. Well, we were meeting every two weeks, and now there's a new meeting every week. Um, so this is there's been a lot of conversations about this. Um, yes. Okay. Great. Thank you. I appreciate it and uh, appreciate the information on the comparisons between uh, PRK and other forms of interim housing as well that the report contained. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Raman. Um, I'm not seeing any other questions from any of my other colleagues right now. Um, I think the only one we have here is uh, Mr. Buscaino, you know, and that's it. Uh, but I don't see no other hands that are raised right now. Uh, Molly, if, if, if the time permits, if you could stick around just for a few moments in case someone uh, brings up a, another question or commentary. Let me go to Doug, uh, uh, Guthrie, right now. Doug, if you're around, hey, good, welcome. You're so dapper, you know? <laughs> uh, but uh, uh, good morning, and, and I, I do have a question for you, Doug, over at uh, HACLA. And I know it's HACLA's role to, to process the the application vouchers uh, for the residents who, who uh, and, and to work obviously with the property owners uh, right now um, to develop the database uh, of units uh, of folks who are willing to take the vouchers, uh, not just the normal Section 8 vouchers, but in this case, the, the, the emergency, the housing uh, vouchers. Um, uh, I think recently HACLA has received, you know, some negative feedback, and, and primarily I think this was a story, you know, in the Los Angeles Times, and you had some folks sort of piling on uh, as a result of how those applications were processed. I, I want to give you this opportunity and, and give us the current status of, of the vouchers and how uh, is HACLA assisting its residents in placement. And, and I, I ask with a clear understanding the vouchers are, are not the panacea for room key, but they are a, a very important component. So I'm going to give you that opportunity. And as I had stated earlier with Molly, you know, Doug, I, I know that the the rental market is as is, is tight as can be, you know, vacancies um, at, at extremely, uh, a very low level. Um, and we're dealing, you know, with a, a community of folks who have, are either I, a chronically homeless or recently homeless that at times it is a challenge uh, for landlords to, you know, have an open mind, be more flexible and welcome folks in. We've got that challenge, but ultimately at the end of the day, you got these sort of asset capacity challenge right there. But I want to give this opportunity to you, Doug, and, and the folks over at HACLA. So why don't you take it away? And thank you, Council Member, and thanks to the uh, members of the committee here. Let me speak to the LA Times article first. Uh, I was a little surprised to see the article came out the way it did. Uh, those things do happen. Uh, I had had discussions with the reporter, and it's not as though all the information provided in that article was inaccurate. I just think that the conclusions that were drawn were very negative when they really didn't need to be. And, and let me speak to that. I can go through some of these numbers and how the program started and where it is now. Uh, and, and then we can come back in more detail to the LA Times if you like. Uh, first of all, we received an allocation of 3,365 emergency housing vouchers uh, in July 1st of just last year. So we've been running this program for slightly over a year. Uh, I admitted both in the article and to others that have asked, I, I think we got off to a fairly slow start on the program, and that mostly had to do, we had to add 35 additional staff, and, and we did have staffing capacity issues, uh, just finding the people, getting them trained, uh, and getting up to speed on the program, uh, and, and so I do think we got off to a slow start on that. Uh, when we finally got well underway, uh, there is really a two-step process. Is, uh, first of all, we have to get uh, the applications in, uh, and this program is set up to run through the continuum of care, and so it all runs through losses, so all the applications that we get are referred to us by losses. So we had to get that organized, get the providers working on behalf of LASA to get those applications prepared and then forwarded to us. Then our first order of business is to issue vouchers. 
And uh, so that's really step one in the process. And step two, of course, is making sure that once somebody has a voucher, they can actually use it. Uh, because getting a voucher doesn't accomplish much uh, other than an opportunity to take advantage of, of these types of housing resources. So uh, we uh, picked up the pace dramatically towards the end of last year. And as of July 1st of this year, we had issued 100% of the vouchers that we've been awarded. And I know I gave the uh, committee a report and I even have, uh, uh, the, the numbers are dynamic and so they change on a regular basis, but uh, now we've issued 3,827 vouchers. So we've actually over issued what our allocation of vouchers are. This is somewhat with the assumption that some of the vouchers just won't go through, some will be returned. We wanna make sure that uh, we're fully utilizing the program. Uh, we have until September of 2023 uh, on this program, and again, HUD hasn't been entirely clear about this, but we know that we cannot issue vouchers or reissue vouchers after September of 2023. So we have another 13 months or so. We've already issued over 100% of the vouchers. Uh, but we want to be in a position to fully utilize those vouchers uh, in that time frame by 2023, well, those vouchers still outstanding after September of next year, we'll still be able to keep that voucher uh, within the time frame they have to use that voucher. Uh, so we're pretty confident we're going to make 100% usage of this very uh, important program. I'm going to go through a couple of other numbers here first, too, and be happy to, to answer questions. Um, so we now have actively searching 2,800 plus voucher holders that are out actively searching. Uh, we've actually leased 377 units and we have another 495 units that have been identified uh, by Section 8 applicants and we're in the process of getting those lease documents prepared for execution. So we have 872 units as of right now uh, that are in the process of being leased. The article in the LA Times decided they wanted to take data from HUD that, that lags by two or three months what we're actually doing, uh, which painted a worse picture. And even though we gave them the accurate numbers, they chose not to use them. So that was one of my kind of beefs with the LA Times. Uh, and also back to Project Roomkey. So one of our early targets uh, uh, working with LASA, working with the mayor's office, uh, we're well aware of, of kind of the wind down of Project Room Key. We knew that it was really important to, to the extent we could utilize emergency housing vouchers uh, uh, for Project Room Key. We wanted to do that, and so we focused on that. Uh, LASA made sure that some of our, our earliest applicants uh, coming from them uh, through the continuum of care were uh, eligible applicants of Project Room Key. I know Molly put some numbers up there. I think our numbers are a little more optimistic, Molly. And like I say, this is a, it's, it's a constantly, every day, the, the numbers are changing, but in, in a very positive way. So the date we've issued 587 vouchers to Project Green Key recipients in total. And uh, we've either leased or at least is in process for 135 uh, of those recipients of those vouchers. So we're making a lot of headway uh, uh, on that program, obviously not enough. Obviously, it's not a panacea to all of the challenges being faced. Uh, there's a lot more to go, and there are a lot of other solutions out there besides just the emergency housing voucher uh, program. Uh, we haven't mentioned Project Home Key, but there are more units in the works around Project Home Key that are coming up uh, fairly quickly. We didn't mention uh, Triple H, and, and that's coming to fruition now with thousands of, of new units coming on board that have project-based vouchers already uh, that are going to be vacant and available units coming online as we speak, and particularly over the next 18 months or so. And, and I know Ann Sewell could speak uh, more to that than, than I could. So there will be a continuing flow of resources uh, beyond just the emergency housing voucher program. Uh, Challenges with using the vouchers, absolutely. We've extended the search time to 360 days. Uh, we got a waiver from HUD to do that, uh, which is the longest that we've ever done. So people don't have to be fearful right away if they can't search and find a place. Uh, you know, that is, that is on the good side. But 
with all, we've got this program, our regular Section 8 Housing Choice Voucher Program, we have over 4,000 vouchers on the street right now, which is the most we've ever had uh, in the history of the Housing Authority. And combined with the county that has over 3,000 vouchers on the street, the same sort of situation that we have, uh, that's 7,000 people that are searching for housing within L.A. County. Uh, I, I would dare to say that's more than ever and particularly in one of the toughest markets that LA has experienced in a long, long time. Uh, we too have uh, hired what we're calling housing navigators. It's a, it's a, it's a position with us within the uh, EHV program that we're training people on how to be of assistance and getting through the housing navigation process. We, taught, we hired two outside real estate firms to identify vacant available units uh, with landlords that are receptive to the program. We're constantly reaching out to landlords uh, to pull them into the program. And I, I think our biggest challenge on a going forward basis, at least on our end of things, is making sure once we have those matches, we need to do our part in doing as effectively and as efficiently as possible of getting those leases signed and getting people moved in. And uh, that you know that it, it's always a challenge and we're never as good as we would like to be but that's where our focus lies at this point in time so uh maybe i can stop with that and be happy to answer any questions that the members of this uh, committee might have thank you very much Doug. I, I just got a couple of questions one is um can you like molly can you through your estimation uh, tell us what's the biggest challenge um, that someone has uh, a voucher in hand um, and connected them actually to the physical asset itself. Um, is, is it just is it a supply issue? What is the biggest challenge there? And the two is, you know, uh, what do we need to do to secure actually more vouchers uh, from HUD? And the reason why I say that is sometimes we act collectively as if we're thankful for the allotment that we just received from the mothership in Washington, D.C., from HUD. Uh, we shouldn't be thankful. We should, uh, this should be a baseline, you know, given the gargantuan, you know, uh, a crisis that is happening here. And quite frankly, in the short time period I've been here, I've gone through a whole list of things. I see major structural flaws in policy and regulations in HUD that actually have made the situation much more complex to get folks into housing. So I don't know, separate from that, I'd like to actually sit down and discuss with you what recommendations you would make with regards to what regulatory changes have to take place at HUD, because we have the largest congressional delegation uh, in the nation in our own backyard, but we don't utilize them. I think we, 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 we get happy or giddy if the Secretary of HUD shows up and somehow some way a gift has, you know, someone has descended from the heavens. Well, all you have to do is look at the, the crisis and how long it's been going on. And to me, it's like, mm, no, it's just like when the Secretary of the VA showed up on the west side of LA, and all of a sudden there was 25 tiny homes on VA federal property, which by the way, were financed by the by former governor Arnold Schwarzenegger. Well, this is the Secretary of the VA, and these are men and women who have you know, risked their lives to protect this country. Okay. Uh, living on the streets, and all of a sudden, this, this was a big issue, you know, uh, and there was nothing. It was all much ado. But so the question is here is what is the challenge? Because on the navigating side, and you know, to tip my hand here, we're going to have also a hearing too on the navigators, you know, on the nonprofit side, because we don't have metrics with regards to what they're doing and if what they're doing is actually successful or not. We just know that they do. We don't know if they're successful or not at all whatsoever. We're sort of an automatic pilot. We just give. We appropriate and we give. You know, and whether path, for example, is spot four, all we know is we give. You know, but we actually know have no clue if they're actually meeting metrics because we have never created real metrics to begin with. So we're just giving money out willy nilly. And not really expecting and hoping and praying for the very best but not knowing, you know, what to, to sort of measure a baseline with, you know. Um, so that's, I think that's going to be important is real metrics on 501c3s to make sure that they're actually producing. So I'm kind of getting tired of, uh-oh, rally the troops, get folks to start calling in, you know, on the public comment side, 
you know, for this agency or that agency or this entity or that entity, you know, this, you know, committee should be expecting, you know, you know, uh, successful results because the community deserves it, Angelinos deserve it, and more importantly, our in-house neighbors deserve it. So if you can take a crack at those two questions, I appreciate it. Well, let, let me uh, try to respond to your first question first with regards to just locally uh, what is working and what could work better. And I, I think that starts with, uh, of course, there, there is limited supply of housing that is available. I think we all know that and we accept it. But to the extent that we've identified uh, housing units that are available, uh, that, that uh, could be available for the, uh, for the EHB program. Uh, I think the challenge has been then matching people, you know, that have resources in hand. Well, who do you pick? How do you get them? How do you get them out to the unit in short order? Transportation is always an issue. Uh, just, uh, you can't, it's hard to do one-offs on individuals. So you try to, try to, to bus people out to, uh, you know, spending the day moving around a different unit availability and, and, and that hasn't always worked as well. So I think just making that connection and that match is something we need to continue uh, to improve upon. Uh, secondly, and, and I know earlier you talked about the Cecil Hotel uh, and, and Council Member Rodriguez may have, may have mentioned it or someone else did about, well, you've got a place in North Hollywood, but they want to live on the west side. I mean, we see that a fair amount. The Cecil Hotel, there have been numerous referrals with emergency housing vouchers to the Cecil where people said, I don't want to live here. Uh, so, uh, can I say, I, uh, we, I grew up, youngest child, a single immigrant mother with a third grade education. We lived in Logan Heights. We wanted a little La Jolla, you know, but unfortunately we didn't have the financial wherewithal to live in La Jolla. So we grew up in the poorest neighborhood in Logan Heights. Just want to throw that commentary out there. For right. people. Sometimes we're dealing with realities here, what space opens up, how we need to move, you know. And I think we get paralyzed as elected officials, whether it's LASA, whether it's other agencies and departments, we just get paralyzed. And we say, okay, we have to adapt to all. If folks want to live on the beach, they want to live, you know, up on top of the hills, the Silver Lake or Echo Park or in Eagle Rock, I mean, that's just not life. That's just not reality. We've got to move folks with a sense of urgency to put a roof over their head. Yeah, I, I think uh, all I'm trying to say is that that is a reality that's faced. Yeah, I didn't say you were advocating that. I just want to swear. I didn't say you were advocating that right there. Yeah. Uh, and uh, with regards to the national picture, we've been working with our own congressional delegation for quite some period of time. We work closely with HUD senior management uh, from the secretary down. Uh, there are some things in the works. Of course, we've gone from Build Back Better, which would have uh, resulted in uh, probably in the range of 14 to 15,000 additional Section 8 housing units just for the city of LA under the original Build Back Better proposal. Uh, that, of course, went through many iterations and, and is currently off the table in that form. But in the fiscal year 22 budget that was approved, there was an additional allocation of Section 8 vouchers. We're waiting, uh, and, and HUD is very late in getting these out, but we're waiting for our share of that allocation. I expect it to be another five to 600 vouchers. We've already, and this gets to, I think, a bigger issue yet, uh, we, we've already uh, uh, told the city and, and the housing department and Sewell that we would take 30% of whatever we get and, and commit it to the city in a way of project-based factors. So uh, I think uh, we all know that there, there's a dearth of project-based voucher availability for some of the project home key developments, for uh, developments still in the pipeline for permanent supportive housing. Uh, we are capped uh, legislatively, statutorily, on what we can do on that, and we're reaching the limitations of our cap of which we've been warning folks about now for the past two to three years. So uh, the availability of project-based vouchers for a long-term solution to permanent supportive housing is clearly a major stumbling block uh, in what we currently have to work with and, and something that, that really deserves a lot more discussion. In, indeed, and, and we may have a hearing, uh, another just on this or here, and, and try to figure out from that or maybe just some off-site meetings with you, Doug, uh, and the good folks at HACLA uh, to get a little deeper on this than to come out with some actionable items 
Uh, so whether they need, you know, uh, uh, regulatory changes or, or God forbid any statutory changes because statutory changes would take God knows how many years, you know, uh, into the future. We need, you know, move folks to move with a sense of urgency and a sense of action. Like I've said, you know, people can pontificate on the House floor, you know, about the, the, the framers of democracy, but that doesn't pay the rent at the end of the day, you know, uh, whether the, the value of a, of a voucher has to increase and the quantity of the vouchers, you know, have to increase, you know, commensurate with the current crisis that we're having, you know, uh, on our streets, you know, every day. And obviously not just, you know, folks who are experiencing homelessness, but, you know, uh, working families, you know, who are, who are not homeless at this moment, uh, who are at the cusp of being homeless when it comes to the sector uh, eight voucher housing. I know that for right. example, my sister, you know, at one time uh, was on a, a section eight voucher housing list. And I think it was like, she told me what, this was years ago, years ago. I think it was, she was like a 10 year waiting list, you know? Right. Yeah, it's just, that's absurd. That's a budgetary issue, you know, an allocation issue. You know, and um, that's just, it's, 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 it's the height of absurdity in my now, I mean, now that you raise it, it's an important point. We intend to be going out in October to open up the Section 8 wait list once again for the regular Housing Choice Voucher Program. Uh, I would anticipate we'll get somewhere in the range of 200,000 applications uh, or more. And we'll have to do a lottery to pull that down. 200,000 applications for how many vouchers? Well, for our total number of, of voucher authorities, about 51,000 for the Housing Choice Voucher Program. However, we've taken 30% of those and dedicated those to project-based vouchers. So uh, for the actual tenant-based program, you know, we're down in, in the mid-30,000 range. Uh, and uh, you know, that's one of the reasons why... You know, the dynamic of all this, you move more out of a current program to project basing, you're going to be taking away from the regular housing choice voucher program. And again, that's a much bigger uh, conversation that is worth having. Uh, so we would love to see huge increases in the overall Section 8 program and, and some more flexibilities that we had during the CARES Act. And we'll, we'll find a way to make use of those vouchers. Thank you, Doug. And we definitely have to 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 join forces because if I heard correctly, and I'm not saying that you did the wrong thing, you did what you have to react to what reality is. When you take thirty percent of that voter, and not voter poll, but that that universe, right? That that means there's also less, if you will. You have to split the baby. It's Solomon's choice. You know, you have to. There'll be less. You know, for those you know who are on the cusp of homelessness right now, because obviously inflation and other macroeconomic issues with regards to the rents and rent increasing even more so uh, and the lack of availability, you know, we have to deal with the supply issue, not just uh, on the actual physical units themselves, but also to, we have to have the an increase in the vouchers. It's, it goes with each other, you know, because one, for, some folks can say clearly, well, it doesn't make sense if you have a huge allocation of more vouchers when you have nowhere to go. And other folks could say, you know, well, you know, um, now we have, you know, more physical, you know, uh, assets to place folks, but we simply don't have enough vouchers. They have to work hand in hand with each other and have to go with each other. Um, I think that, and that we'll definitely continue this conversation, but um, I think we have Ms. Rob. I see Ms. Roman's hand is raised, and I think this will be it right there. Does anyone else have anything else for Molly or Doug, Ms. Roman? The, uh, the, the mic is yours. Uh, thank you so much, and thank you, uh, Doug, for that presentation about uh, the voucher process. Can you talk to us a little bit about the inspection process and how long that takes? So once a voucher holder finds a home, either through a housing navigator or through a case manager or whatever, how long does it take for that house which matches their voucher um, to be approved as a place that they can go to? Well, that's, that's a good question and that's a very timely question because I was getting feedback on that just earlier this week and, and we've had some complaints come in saying, 
it takes too long to get an inspection. I checked with the director of our inspections just yesterday, as a matter of fact. Oh, I'm and, sorry, Doug, if I could interrupt you. Even, yes. Do you think you could just describe what that process is? Like once you've met, once you found an apartment that fits, what does a voucher holder have to do in order to actually move into that house? Well, uh, first of all, they, they have to get, the, the landlord has to request an approval. Uh, uh, to move that tenant in. That's what, what we see in the reports, RFTA, that's request for tenant approval. And, and that triggers a couple of things. One, it, it starts with an inspection of that unit to make sure it passes Section 8 housing quality standards. Mm -hmm. and, and to the extent it doesn't, uh, the owner of that unit is given a certain amount of time to bring it up to those quality standards. And usually it's, there are minor issues involved uh, uh, to do that. And we've actually instituted a program to provide up to $5,000 grant to landlords uh, to meet those requirements uh, as part of the emergency housing voucher program. So the first step in that is make that request to us. It's passed along, let's schedule an inspection. Inspections uh, are normally taking two to three days to, to get an inspector out there. And, and then it's a matter of getting a report back from the inspector and then resolving any outstanding issues then we continue to work with the landlord uh, to get uh, to get the lease prepared for execution, uh, to get you know landlord background, to get uh, the landlord accounts where we make payments to, etc. Uh, so that whole process, I think, is the key. We we need to be doing this in less than 30 days, and in some instances, it's been taking more like uh, 45 to 60 days. So we have to improve that whole process and that's that's one of the reasons uh, if landlords say they don't want to work with us that's one of the reasons they can't afford those kinds of delays when they've got empty units sitting there that are in high demand mm -hmm. and you're saying the whole process needs to happen in less than 30 days do you have a sense of how long it's taking right now well as i said i think it's been ranging uh, closer to 45 days and i actually i think 30 days is too long Right. Uh, so we're focused on that. We've shifted gears in the EHB program because we've got all these vouchers outstanding there now. We formed a, a separate operation focused solely on these requests for tenant approvals to get to speed up the processing of those. So that's where our focus of attention is. And do you feel like you have the resources you need to be able to move to a much shorter time frame for the? Uh, apartments to be approved or is there additional resources or support that you need from the city in order to make that happen? No, I think we have the financial resources we need. Uh, uh, staff capacity uh, ha has been an issue from the beginning of COVID. I know Molly could speak to that on Lassa's end, the provider's end. Uh, all of us, uh, I think, struggle from time to time in having the capacity levels that we had prior to COVID-19. Uh, but uh, financially, uh, we have the resources that, that we need to do the job. Okay. Thank you, Doug. I appreciate your report um, and detailed explanation of the process. Sure. Thank you for the question. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Roman, and also thank you very much uh, to both you, Doug, and to Molly, you know, for uh, coming and, and presenting today. I think that that's uh, one well, thank you for the conversation. I don't think there's any other or more questions or comments uh, from the colleagues. So I'm seeing none. So what, what I'm going to do is I'm going to recommend that we note and file the LASA and the HACLA uh, report and adopt the CAO's report. I'm also going to request that this item be sent to the Budget and Finance Committee at the request of the Budget Chair, Mr. Paul Pecorian. Uh, he stated that he will schedule this item for August 22nd uh, of this year. Uh, that being said, uh, Luigi, if you could be so kind of to please call the vote. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Council Member De Leon. Aye. Council Member Raman. Yes. Council Member Buscaino. Si. Council Member Rodriguez. Council Member Rodriguez. Council Member Rodriguez is absent. Council Member Blumenfield. Blumenfield, aye. Four eyes, and this item is approved. Thank you very much. Uh, measure passes on a 4-0 vote again uh, to, to Molly. Thank you very much uh, for coming by today. I think we will see 
uh, 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 Molly for sure, maybe Doug, you know, uh, at the next meeting. Um, that being said, we do, my colleagues have one file item that's before us still today. Let's file item number five, file um, item number five. I know that we have uh, commentary or questions uh, from uh, Ms. Roman. Uh, Ms. Roman? Uh, yes, thank you, uh, Councilmember DeLeon, for giving me a little space to ask a question slash comment about the last moving um, moving clause in this uh, in this motion, which does a lot of work for the city that I think uh, overall we need um, and we need to be thinking about, particularly as a lot of the investments that we've been making over the last few years in permit supportive housing and interim housing come online over the next few years. Um, about the last moving clause, I just had a question about, and I'm not sure whether the department is here to answer it, um, about how a local preference policy, oh, hi Ann, how are you? Um, how a local pre preference policy change like this, um, how does it change what we're doing right now with the catchment areas for the roadmap uh, for our current interim housing um, sites? Because we have some level of geographic kind of targeting um, and, you know, curious about what this looks like relative to that, why we, and, you know, really why we would need something else if we're already doing something which is like a geographic targeting process already. Uh, thank you, Council Member. Anne Sewell, General Manager, Los Angeles Housing Department. Uh, some time ago, even before this motion was uh, was uh, put forth, the uh, city administrative office had asked that we look at um, expanding, you know, local preferences from the catchment area idea that was being used with the roadmap to the permanent housing. And um, you know, we uh, the city is a HUD grantee, even though most of our permanent housing is not built with HUD funds; it's built with local voter approved funds. As a HUD grantee, the Fair Housing Equal Opportunity um, rules of HUD apply to a lot of what we do in housing community development. So we, we went to HUD, we looked at the requirements in the um, HUD guidelines, and we started drafting a, uh, a local preference that tried to meet those requirements to bring to you all, and then also because one of the items in the HUD handbook is it must be approved by HUD um, to take it to HUD couple of things that are in those guidelines are um, we need to get some more specificity from how to, whether they are omitted on person or on, on, uh, intentionally or, or unintentionally. For instance, they only envision a citywide preference. So the city of Los Angeles could have a preference, but not in you know, smaller groups, uh, council offices, zip codes, whatever, within the city. Um, they, they set forth, you know, a lot of guidelines around permanent housing. They're really pretty silent on interim or shelters. So we've, we've been drafting guidelines that track what the requirements are in the HUD guidebook in the entire HUD region that we're in, California, Nevada, Hawaii, et cetera. They've only approved one local preference, and that's the one that we did in CD13. Um, about 10 years ago for a LAUSD site um, that wanted to give preference to employees of LAUSD and had did approve that one, but they haven't approved any others. And, and the major concern, of course, is um, disparate. Sorry, April. and you, you've asked for other kinds of local preference to be included and they've said no? No, we've never asked for one that they said no. We did ask for the one in CD13 and they said yes. Other communities like San Francisco have asked them to approve their local preference, and they have said no. Got it. Um, so no, we uh, we haven't had that experience yet. So the major concern is disparate impact, and you could imagine a you know tiny city that had no diversity trying to have a local preference that excluded everybody around it. Certainly, that is not the case in the city of LA. So um, we're really trying to craft something that would meet their requirements and make the council members concerns about making sure that Los Angeles resources are um, supporting people who, um, uh, who, who are Los Angeles uh, taxpayers and Los Angeles residents. Mm -hmm. So we will yeah. um, be happy to respond to that and bring that back and report back to this motion. 
So, uh, yeah, and if you could, you know, I think there's a real case to be made that interim housing projects in particular serve their immediate geographic neighborhoods. Uh, I think that that's when they're the most useful. That's when they get the most upta uh, uptake in terms of, um, you know, when people move indoors um, from encampments. Um, but I think, that, you know, we face some challenges because uh, sometimes when you have kind of um, catchment areas like the way that they're being currently utilized, uh, often through council district boundaries, sometimes the catchment areas make less sense. So, you know, I think for me, a geographic targeting policy um, makes a lot of sense for interim housing sites, but one that has sometimes arbitrary, you know, lines through neighborhoods because of where a council district border lies, that makes less sense for the effectiveness of the entire system. So I just wanted to flag that as you're looking into this question around interim housing sites and targeting, because I think that that can really, um, it, it, it's not an effective way um, to address sometimes the needs of people who are living in a particular geographic area. Understood, and we'll be sure to flag that. I, I should comment, one of the HUD rules is that a locality cannot discriminate on the basis of length of tenure within the city. So if we had a preference for city of LA residents, we wouldn't be able to say you got more preference points if you've been here five years, 20 years, you know, yesterday, et cetera. It would be, you know, one preference for city residents. And uh, if we talk to them about interim housing, that could certainly have an, you know, uh, by definition, if you are physically present in that district, you're considered a, a local resident um, under the HUD rules. Got it. And this, and, but what you're referring to right now is specifically about um, permanent housing, not interim housing, the rules for HUD. Right. I mean, they don't have a handbook on, uh, on local preferences for interim housing. So we're, we're starting with the permanent and then broadening the conversation to cover the interim as well. Okay. All right. Well, I look forward to uh, learning more as you um, report back on this question. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Uh, Raman. Um, Luigi, if you could be so kind as to read it for the record so we can have a vote on it. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Item number five is a motion by DeLeon Pimenfield Harris Dawson relative to preparing a local preference policy for affordable housing units and subsidized housing units that utilize the coordinated entry system for tenant selection and lease up and the feasibility of preparing a local preference policy for interim housing beds receiving city funds. Thank you very much. Uh, that being said, uh, uh, thank you, Anne, uh, for um, uh, answering the questions of uh, Ms. Traman. That being said, uh, we have item number five that's before us. If Luigi, if you could be so kind of to call Councilmember De Leon. Aye. Councilmember Raman. Yes. Councilmember Buscaino. Councilmember Buscaino. Councilmember Buscaino is absent. Councilmember Rodriguez. Councilmember Rodriguez. Councilmember Rodriguez is absent. Councilmember Blumenfield. Blumenfield, aye. Three ayes, and this item is approved. Motion passes on a three to zero vote. I believe that concludes. Nothing's on the desk. Uh, can you confirm that so we can move on? The desk is clear, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much to all my colleagues, uh, Ms. Rodriguez, Mr. Gustaino, uh, Ms. Raman, Mr. Blumenfield, thank you very much. Uh, to Molly and Doug, thank you very much for coming on board here today. And to all the staff who's uh, helped uh, uh, putting uh, this meeting together, I want to thank each and every one of you. Uh, and to all the callers who called in, this meeting is adjourned. Bye-bye.